uh, really, really excited to have uh, Emily Kuhn join us today to give us a talk on accessibility. Um, you know, we like to bring in speakers on a variety of topics, both technical, uh, from a design perspective, um, sharing, collaboration. We love to really approach Tableau from every angle. Uh, Emily has been a member of the Tableau community uh, really since its founding. Uh, she's played a little bit of every role. Um, she's had a, she has a podcast. She's been an ambassador. She's done a little bit of everything. Um, so really, really excited for her. She's recently taken on a new role with Red Hat um, as a Tableau enablement consultant. So very, very excited to hear her perspective. Um, and, and honestly, just to finally have the ability to have her come speak to the group. So Emily, uh, thank you for joining us today. We're uh, really, really excited to hear from you. I think we'll learn a lot from you. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, can you believe it's been 10 years that I've been active in the Tableau community, or yeah, 10 years since I've been in the Tableau community. My first conference was 2011. So that just blows my mind. Um, <laughs> so today, um, oh, actually, let me, do you all see my um, presentation? Perfect, okay. So today uh, I'm gonna be talking about accessibility and data visualization. And I really consider this to be a primer. So to help people design more accessible dashboards. And honestly, this is, I'm kind of selfish because this presentation is also a way for me to be reminded and to have something written down in terms of what I can do or what considerations I need to make when I'm creating visualizations. So um, as we go through, as Jeremy mentioned, pop your questions in the chat and I'm happy to answer them. I may not know all of the answers, but I probably know the people who do. Um, before I even move on to our next slide, I really, I was really purposeful when I picked out this, um, this graphic to include on the first slide, because I think that it really is a really great reminder about why we need to consider accessibility. Because it's not just people with color blindness, and it's not just people who need screen readers, and it's not permanent. It's so this is a, a graphic that comes from the persona spectrum from Microsoft, and it really goes through four different aspects here, touch, sight, hearing, and speech. And there are three different types of, kind of disabilities, if you will, or um, temporal aspects to these. One is permanent, right? Like the person with one arm. Then there's somebody who has an arm injury, but then there's also the parent and if you have ever been a new parent, you know that you're holding the baby while like working and typing and also like trying to make coffee. It's amazing what you can try to do. And so when you're thinking about accessibility, what I really like one of my greatest, um, it would be amazing if after this talk, you considered it's not just that permanence aspect, it's also can be situational and it's not just for color blindness or for um, blindness in general. So what we're gonna be talking about, really we're gonna be talking about what is accessibility, some of the requirements, um, some simple ways, some high level ways to be more accessible and also some challenges. Um, so before we dig in though, uh, I'm Emily and I'm your guide today. Um, I. I want to share a little bit about why I'm even talking about accessibility. Um, firstly, it was because I had an experience with being a system administrator, a business system administrator for a reporting tool and our IT people and our 508 compliance person, I worked in the public sector at the time, said, this system isn't 508 compliant, you need to make it 508 compliant. And I really struggled with understanding what that meant. Sure, I could go to 508compliance.gov 
or 508.gov, um, the website from the federal government, but that actually didn't give me a lot of good information. It was there was conflicting information out there and even internally um, in my agency that I worked for. And I just gained a new appreciation for what this work involved. And so that's my primary driver for why um, I try to talk about that and be involved in accessibility efforts. Then there's also the personal side. I think about my daughter who's on the neurodiversity, um, well, she's neurodivergent. And I think about my dad who is, um, who's losing his sight. And I think about me, like I'm, I'm typically fully transparent with folks that I speak with. I'm getting early signs of carpal tunnel, which kind of sucks, but that's a limitation right now that I have. Is it permanent? No, um, but it's something that I have to work around. So I really am thinking about the person on the other end. I think about the person in the audience that I don't really know because of HIPAA requirements in the US where we keep our health information private unless we want to volunteer that information like I just did. But I think about the senior manager, the senior advisor, who, because we made a chart more accessible, he could finally under see and understand what we were talking about in a meeting and wasn't just like nodding his head like everybody else was. That is an amazing feeling to know that somebody can actually see what you're talking about, see what the data says. So that's why I am passionate about this. I am also the advocacy lead for the DataViz Ally Working Group, which is across the industry. And so one of my efforts and one of the efforts of the working group is to really provide those resources and get the word out to increase awareness. So that's a little bit about me, but here's how I also think about accessibility. I truly believe accessibility equals innovation and massive benefits. The curb cut is a really fantastic example. Curb cutting may have primarily started out for people in wheelchairs, but now people in strollers use it. I use it with my kids when we're riding our bikes. There are so many mass, there are so many people who've benefited now because of what started out as something that was needed for people in wheelchairs. I also take a look at this example. Transcripts, they're not just for people with hearing challenges. I was in a Facebook group and I've kind of redacted some of this information, but it says when you're taking a course or learning something to take your business to the next level, what do you prefer? Check all apply and add if you want. Video was still the um, predominant winner there, but notice that reading transcripts and workbooks came in second at 39 votes compared to 45. <clears throat> we also see transcripts now on social media platforms like in YouTube videos, on Instagram and Facebook where we have that captioning that's now built into the tool. People are not just needing that because they have problems with their hearing, but it allows them to read. We can read sometimes faster than we can watch videos. So there are people who are massively benefiting beyond the original intent. And so that's how I truly see accessibility, how accessibility can help us in this industry. It can help us be more innovative. Oops. All right, so what does accessibility cover? As I've mentioned, it's more than colorblindness and more than screen readers. It includes blindness, so unable to see visual information. Uh, it also includes color blind blindness or color deficiency, as you may hear it. And that's the inability to reliably distinguish colors. There's limited vision where you can see, but not really well. Um, there's deafness where you cannot hear sounds reliably. Low dexterity, where you're unable to use a pointing device and must use a keyboard or a switch. There's low comprehension, so having problems understanding the content. Low reading, 
which is pro having problems reading text and epilepsy, where somebody may be subject to epileptic ep episodes and seizures. So it, while I think right now, from what I've been seeing and hearing out in the data visualization community, I think we've got a good handle in the, for the most part on red and green color blindness um, and the color palettes. And we're starting to see more and more come up on screen readers and making sure that it's uh, our visualizations can be uh, read by these assistive tools. But it's also more than that. So that's what it covers. And now I'm going to go into what's required. So there's WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. And overall, like I don't want to go too deep into it because that could just be a topic all in itself. Um, but generally speaking, there are four aspects to this. And this is called POR. There, it needs to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. And so there's WCAG, which is web content. But then in the US, we have Section 508. Now, Section 508 uh, is primarily used by the federal government. However, there are aspects where if you do work with the federal government, then your work also needs to be compliant. And so how do these two differ? Uh, well, at one point, 508 standards were really lagging behind WCAG standards. However, it was recently, I mean, relatively recently, I think like a couple years ago, that Section 508 was amended and it now is written to address WCAG level AA, which means that when organizations um, are 508 compliant, they can be pretty confident that they're going to be in compliance with other accessibility standards. So I have this chart here and I'll make sure that Jeremy has uh, these slides, so that way you can also have them for reference. Um, and I, again, I'm not going to go through all of what this includes, but with perceivable, you know, some of the guidelines there um, are text alternatives, time-based media, adaptable, distinguishable, and you can see in the box, the, the outline, that's what WCAG, um, that, that level, A, uh, level 2A or level AA, that is where 508, so you have to be up to that level to be 508 compliant. And then if you wanted to be level AAA, then that would be amazing. Um, that does take some additional effort, right? Like there's a cost associated with that. But knowing that double, if you're double A, you're good to go. So I wanted to run through a few examples of the different types of um, challenges that people may have when it comes to data visualization. And so we have color blindness here. I think everybody has seen some version of this where we have two primary approaches. We can use a colorblind palette. So that orange and blue, um, which is built in um, natively into Tableau, or you can use a high contrast red and green. Um, I personally love, um, if I'm using, I, I think about the color association and I think people inherently know green is good or growth and red is bad or danger or alert. And so if I can capitalize on that color association, then and use high contrast to get my message across so that as many people can see and understand this as possible, then that's what I tend to use. Um, I think it's just easier because we've been conditioned to know about red and green. I mean, it's built into our, in the US with our stoplights. So um, that's one way that you can approach it, but there's two primary approaches, the colorblind palette or the high contrast red and green. We also have to consider low vision. So this is where font size and font choice matter. And so I've just you know, played around a little bit with um, this chart that comes from like the Superstore sample data set and dashboard. So you can see that there's uh, the 
the typical text that we tend to use, but then there's the script text. And if you have low vision, this can be more challenging to read. So, um, you know, default to perhaps the more plain, but the, the script that is easier to read. Um, I actually had a teacher, uh, I guess when we were starting the work uh, schooling at home, and for some reason, her email was sent out and it was all in like a script font. And even me with a pretty good vision, I had a really hard time reading it. And I was like, oh my gosh, I actually have to go back and ask her to convert this to like Arial or something because I cannot really read this. It was a lot of text and it was curse or the script. It was just hard. So, you know, I think about, you know, thinking about your font choice and font size. You also want to make it, uh, and we'll get into examples of this later, want to make it so that people can read it without zooming in if, if possible, um, but then also just large enough that it's easy enough to read with enough spacing involved. Additionally, and I think if you're going to play bingo while I have this presentation, uh, you could win probably with the word contrast because it'll come up a lot. But for individuals with low vision, contrast really matters. So it's not just for colorblindness, it's for individuals to really help them discern the data from the background. And as you can see here, and, and I made this example really, to me, this is egregious because the gray is so light. But I also think about the trend we're seeing in these um, modern dashboards with the light colors on the back, with the light background. And we just need to be considerate. I'm not saying that they're not accessible, but we just need to make sure that there's enough contrast there that people can read through it because calm and trustworthy colors are amazing, but we also need to have contrast to see them. So I want to share with you a case study. Uh, this visualization is called funding disinformation. So I want you to put in the chat whether you think this visualization is accessible just put yes or no. And no, it depends. I've been around long enough. I know that that's the thing. I'm going to open up the chat here to see what people are saying. I've got no's, no's, no's. Oh, come on. Not even a yes from somebody. Oh, thank you, Stephanie and Joy. You're my favorite people right now. <laughs> yeah, so yes ish. Okay. Um, I guess that that's allowable. Uh, no. Okay. So, right. I've got a mix of yeses and nos. So I need a drum roll like. <laughs> oh, whoa. There we go. Oh, oh yeah. So before I give the answer, I want to share with you. Um, I, in this working group that I'm in, uh, one of the people who's involved with it is Fred, uh, Fred, good grief, Frank uh, Elavisky. And Frank has done a lot of great work on accessibility, but he was putting together this audit tool, which he now calls Chartability. Back when he was developing it out, it was called Poor Calf. And so I volunteered. I said, look, I've got this visualization. You can, I would love to do a self audit on it. And then also for you to do an audit and let's compare. Like I looked at my visualization and was like, I mean, there's probably a few things that I can improve upon, but really it's like a bar chart, a pie chart. I mean, sure. I've got like the little circle uh, plots there, but you know, it, it's like, there's nothing complex about this. I felt really good going into this, which I think as you know, as I'm setting it up, you can probably tell what the answer is. No, my visualization was not accessible. And I have, this was my, this emoji was really, <laughs> really represented my feelings on it. I was like, oh, how can this be? I mean, it's, 
I didn't really think that it was that bad. Now I put like the worst picture I could find from Frank's audit, um, <laughs> which look at all that red. Ugh. But so what I want to go through is um, I want to cover some of the major findings with this, as well as some of the recommendations, and then we can move forward. Um, I'll also have a link where like my self audit and Frank's audit is available online where if you'd like to, you can walk through this particular case study. Um, so you can see kind of how, um, how robust the audit was and what you might want to do going forward and provide you that resource. If you want to audit your own work, you can use that as a resource as well. Okay, so let's get to the major findings. There was not enough contrast. So it wasn't just the contrast between like the bars and the background or the text in the background. It was um, even with the lines like on that pie chart, not enough um, color to differentiate it very well. I only used color for context. Um, so like with the circles, uh, for do the companies actually align with the sites? You know, I've got that dark blue. So that was not really that there wasn't enough contrast there, but I was only using color. And what I could have done was to use shapes and color. And then the placement order is inaccurate. So that's really what this red is all about. Um, so Frank tried to go in and navigate through my dashboard with a screen reader. And he tried it a couple of different ways, which is why you see some of these yellow marks and uh, different, different uh, paths. But essentially what happened was I, I built my dashboard and I didn't think about like, the order in which I built it, I just built it. And then I got rid of some of the titles and used text boxes because that looked like a better layout. And I kind of like did some small little hacky things and it just created this looks like uh, Washington DC traffic. I mean, it looks horrible with all of the red. So because I wasn't intentional about the order in which I placed the objects in the dashboard, it caused the screen reader to read like top, then bottom, then middle, then top, then, I mean, it was all over the place. So it didn't really make sense to somebody using a screen reader. And there was no instructions for interaction. Like I just relied on what I thought was a good flow of information to help people. So here are some of the recommendations. Contrast, contrast, contrast. Contrast your axis fonts, border colors, every color in the color palette. Now, when I did my self audit, if you go to look this up, you'll see that I say, yeah, I'm okay with the colors. And this is a point that I want to touch on for a minute because um, I know like for me, I was just excited to do a visualization. I don't do that many of them um, because I'm doing other things in the community or I'm working or doing whatever. Um, so I was like truly excited to be inspired to do this visualization. And really the audience was primarily me. And so I was fine with these colors, but Really, if I take a step back and look at it objectively, the minute I put this visualization out there on Twitter, which I did, it became available for anyone to take a look at. So if it was truly a, if, if I was truly the audience, I didn't have to put it, I wouldn't need to put it out on Twitter. I could just look at it myself and go, oh, great job, Em. So the minute you put it out on Twitter, you are opening it up for other people to be the audience. And that's where I think we um, there's opportunity for us to make sure our visualizations are more accessible. 
And so that's an opinion, right? Like that's not a fact, that's an opinion. So you can decide for yourself how you wanna handle that, but think about other people taking a look at your visualization and you not knowing whether they have a permanent um, short-term or temporary type of challenge or what's going on. So <clears throat> we've talked about contrast, double encode, don't just rely on color. Um, spacing. I needed more white space, um, otherwise known as blank space. You'll see in my audit where I was like, wait, does it actually have to be white? I don't know why I was thinking that that day. Like I know the concept of white space. Um, so I like to use the term like blank space. Um, so I needed more of that. Um, don't rely on tooltips. Like my, I had really great tooltips, but the screen reader couldn't read them. And it could have been the way I set it up. Um, but don't rely on those. And then add instructional language. Like I didn't have that in here. And so I just thought that somebody would be able to follow the flow um, on how to use the dashboard or what to do. Um, and then finally, and I touched on this before, make sure the dashboard is built in proper order. And so I'll get to like how you can do that. So, I have some considerations and ways to solve them. This is super high level um, in some cases. So I have this chart where it's, you know, if there's blindness, make sure it's a, you can use a screen reader or voiceover on a Mac. Color blindness, use contrasting colors or double encoding. Like I knew this stuff, but I still didn't think to do it. Um, limited vision. Select a readable font, use contrast, use that white or blank space. Um, again, like don't rely on audio or captioning. So that way you can solve for deafness, make it accessible with a keyboard if there's low dexterity. Uh, annotation can help with low comprehension. High contrast, appropriate font choice can help with low reading. And if you're using animation or flashes, in your dashboard for some reason, make sure that they don't go more than three flashes in one second. I have tested out um, Tableau's animations and the change there is within this time, but with this, within this guideline. So here are some actionable tips for accessibility. Alt text your images. So I have this little uh, example at the bot uh, on the right hand side here What's more informative for a screen reader, image one demo or sales by geography in the continental US? Sales by geography, right? A screen reader reads the description of the image, so make it informative. Contrast your colors. Contrasting will help people see. And you can see here that I have um, the, a few examples where I've got black and white where there's a high contrast. Uh, blue and orange. Uh, this particular, these particular shades are at a 4.35, which is moderate or okay. And this red and green, these two shades here are at a 1.28, which means it's not um, contrast, there's not enough contrast. Use white or blank space. So spacing, what it's doing is it's helping detect differences. And so that's really the purpose of it. So you can see this example. This is um, credit to storytelling with data and Amy Cecil, where there's no line, and then there's this white divider line that can help you see the differences. And then use your like choose a good font and and how you construct sentences matter. So make sure the font choice can accommodate increased text sizes without loss of readability or functionality. We should be able to zoom up to 200% without losing that readability. So you'd want to choose a font that will allow you to do that. And I love this example here because we tend to just go with Arial a lot. It's built in, it's a default, but look at the differences between Arial and Verdana. The I is huge. Like my daughter who is dyslexic, said to me the other day, she's like, I don't understand why people don't use the I, like do, write the I the correct way, because how do you know, is it an I or is it an L? 
Now my daughter is a rising fifth grader, um, but for her, she can't tell. And so it's really hard for her to read something correctly when for her, it just looks like all L's. Um, so, and I have this example, this is credit to webaim.org. So you have like three popular fonts, Ariel, Tahoma, and Verdana. And you can see it's not just, um, not just the letters, but the spacing in the letters, right? So Verdana actually has more spacing between the characters. And so it's a better font choice. And I know that we all work with corporate, or a lot of us work with corporate fonts. And so if you're involved in that process, um, you know, you can also just compare your corporate font to something like Verdana or Arial to see how it compares. Um, but a lot of times when you commission a corporate font or your own personal font, you can put that in as a requirement or it's been considered. And another tip is to annotate to understand. So providing annotation helps a reader understand what's happening here. So this is a, the graphic is real. I got it from webaim.org but I made up the annotation as the example. So the West Coast switch causes a bubble up in issues in California. It's easier to understand what's happening here versus the other graph where I look at it and go, cool, but like, what's it telling me? And I remember having this feeling when I was in a class, when I worked in the public sector, for balance sheet management. And there was this chart there in the class and we were supposed to uh, interpret it. And I had no idea. And I'm not a dumb person. I didn't, I don't think that I have a comprehension issue, but even me in that class, I remember that feeling of, oh my God, I feel so dumb. Like, I don't know what this means or says I, I didn't want to raise my hand and look stupid. And so even beyond comprehension for somebody who needs it, what about the person who it could just help them, you know, help them understand a little better um, without having to raise their hand or put themselves on blast uh, that they need some help. Um, and so that's what I think about when I think about annotation. And then we have testing flashes. So if you were to use flashes in your visualization, there's a tool that can help you test it. Um, it's available for Windows users um, and Mac if you run bootcamp. Um, but it allows you to see the number of flashes per second and whether it passes or fails the threshold. And one of the biggest best tips is quite simple, which is simplicity is better. Um, showing data at a more aggregate level so it doesn't overwhelm a screen reader or other assistive technology. And so a screen reader is going to read every single cell in that chart to the left or that table to the left. And if you've heard screen readers and you're not used to it, that's a lot. And while somebody who uses screen readers might say, yeah, I'm used to that, but that's still a lot to comprehend, right? Like they're listening to what we're seeing and the same, con the same issues apply with the text table, whether you, uh, with this amount of data, whether it's visual or auditory. So, you know, how can I tell which is the biggest? Okay, well now if I'm listening to it, I've got to remember back to what was on cell two or C2, oh, you know, like it increases that cognitive load and it makes us work harder to get to what the meaning of the data is. So where possible, go more, be more aggregate, make it simple. And look, I know we have challenges, um, and, but I think that we have super smart people in the data visualization and the Tableau community that we can help find a balance for these. So one of the challenges is interactivity. Can a screen reader read it? Um, chart types like network diagrams look cool and can be really helpful, 
but they're not easily translated into a table. So how can we solve for that? And big data, overwhelming someone with so many numbers. Again, we just had that example and it wasn't even that big, but it was that text table of all of that data. And how can we comprehend that, especially with the use of a screen reader? So how to face some of these challenges in Tableau? So I put one of the biggest issues because for screen readers, this is a huge issue, is the order in which our dashboards are read. So one way is to, for, is to order your dashboards, how somebody would read it from the top to bottom. Now you can do that manually by dragging in in the appropriate order. And if you want to do that, I would say uh, one tip is you can number your worksheets so that way you can like make sure you're dragging one at the top to next to, the, you know, and go in that order that way. So you know which ones to move where. Um, you can also modify the XML. Tableau has uh, a knowledge base article, I think, on they have an article on how to do that, which is linked in the presentation here. Use titles, not text boxes. Um, don't use images as titles. Again, Again, unless you're putting an, um, a descriptor there, the screen reader is not going to read the image. So it would read the font if that were the case. So if you need to use an image, make sure you alt uh, text it and have alternative text. Use captions and legends and make sure that you modify that default in Tableau. So instead of category, it could be pick the product type or whatever, however you would naturally say that. Add instructional language on how to use the visualization and what you want people to do. Um, you can use tooltips, but also make sure like you can format them into narratives. That was when Frank did my audit, he actually had, he actually had a couple of nice things to say. Um, and one of them was that he really appreciated how I wrote my tooltips. So I tend to write my tooltips in a narrative. Um, and he said that that was a really, that was a nice thing to do because it helped him understand. And then just because you can doesn't mean you should. So really think about, do you need that complex chart? Um, or is that just something that you want to do because it's cool or, you know, it has some engaging element to it. So if you don't need to do it, don't. Um, also, you know, visiting 70 million data points, that's a lot of data to put in a visualization. And while that's an egregious number, really think about, can I keep it more simple? And sometimes the answer is going to be no, and we'll just have, you just have to figure out a way to do your best with what you need to do. But thinking about these things and considering them up front will help you build more accessible visualizations. So I've got some resources and listen, I am not going to ask you to write all of these down. I will get Jeremy that presentation because I have a lot of resources that I reviewed as I was putting this presentation together, a lot of great resources for you to look at. So chartability.fizz.studio is probably like if you were to bookmark one, I would say bookmark that one because it also has resources for um, a short list of resources and long list of resources for accessibility, like the Microsoft um, Personas guide that they use for accessibility. It's just a really great resource all around. So bookmark chartability.fizz.studio, but there's a whole host of others here. I also have some Tableau resources as well that are built into this, um, these two resource guides or slides. And if you're so inclined, you can experience the screen reader for yourself. This is a YouTube link for, um, and usually I go over it um, when I, if I have time in the, my presentations, but for today, I'll just provide you the link. Um, and this is a screen record, this is a recording of somebody using a screen reader for a SEPTA, uh, which is the Philadelphia uh, like subway system or train system. So uh, using the it's the screen reader is reading the SEPTA table and you'll be able to experience what it's like to 
have a screen reader. Finally, are you overwhelmed? I know, I mean, if I'm being honest, I'm kind of overwhelmed with this sometimes because it's like, okay, so like, who do I need to consider this for? What do I do? How can I make, like, do I serve everybody with all of this? It can be overwhelming. Uh, but I go back to something that I learned as a bank examiner. And that is when I was reading regulations, which uh, reading regulations and understanding, interpreting and assessing compliance for them. I, some of these regulations were really complex and I was like, oh my gosh, like what if this exact scenario is not covered? What do we do? Or, you know, like, not everything is black and white. And I had a senior examiner tell me, Emily, are they complying with the spirit and intent? Are their actions aligned with the spirit and intent of the regulation? That has really stuck with me because I think if you, if you think about the spirit and intent of what you're doing, and yes, you're not going to have, like, I don't think that there is like this perfectly accessible visualization out there, or if it is, it's probably a very small text table and that's it, but that's not real life. So just think about what can I do in the spirit and intent to be more accessible? Like, am I working in that manner? And if you are, then you're doing good. And I think Again, it's overwhelming because there's a lot, but I think if you take one step daily, it'll lead to a mile of progress. So maybe today it's using Verdana and, or maybe actually today it should be the, uh, the order of your dashboard. <laughs> Tomorrow it's Verdana from Ariel, right? So these can be small changes that really don't have a major impact on, um, kind of the look and feel necessarily, like probably nobody's going to notice that you changed from Ariel to Veridana, or they're definitely not going to notice um, if they're just looking at a visualization that you changed the order of it, but a screen reader would. So you can start with those small steps and then build on as, appropriate, as you can. So, um, here's my last slide. And if you would, if you want to connect with me, I'm super happy to do that. My email is there. You can also connect with me on Twitter. The QR code should take you right there. Uh, I, I know that the Tableau community is amazing. And I know that we are really smart people. And I know that we can use accessibility to help us innovate. I know that Tableau has some work to do to make it easier for us, right? Like we shouldn't have to hack the XML and that's okay. We can continue to voice, um, we can continue to raise awareness or I can continue to raise awareness and be a good citizen of this community to help as many people as possible build visualizations that as many people can see, understand and experience. So if there are any questions, I will be happy to try to answer them now. Oh, Jeremy, I just saw your so many red marks. Yeah, he, uh, he, he didn't really take it very easy on you there. I figured maybe he'd give you back like a, a lightly marked up copy to introduce the concept. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was one of those things where he had time, he had space in his schedule to, and he hadn't done like a full-blown audit. So he chose my visualization to do this full-blown audit on. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I'm hurt. <laughs> I mean, it's good to know, but there were some things that, and you'll see, I didn't even really get into, I think I have it linked. Um, but the, the audit itself, he's like, Emily, because I had a conversation with him afterwards and I was like, look, some of this stuff I don't understand. What do you mean tab stops? There are things that if you are not what I'll call super techie, but because that's how I think about myself. But if you don't understand all of that, all of those aspects that aren't really clear on the surface, like how many people here know about tab stops? Um, 
yeah, I like, I don't. So I'm like, how would I know about that? How would I know that these things, and there was so much in that audit. Like I had to step away and go, okay, I can't digest all of this right now because there's so much. Yeah. And that's just that, to me, that was a pretty basic dashboard. Like there wasn't anything kind of exotic there. Yeah. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's great. I really appreciate the, the perspective, Emily. It's been super helpful. I know for me, I think uh, a lot of us have, like you mentioned, corporate templates to think about. And, um, it, and, and, and the way you phrased it at the end, right? What, what's that one small thing we could look to do today and then tomorrow and then the next day to start to make our, our design more accessible, just in general, to really start to move the needle there? Um, really really appreciate the 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 presentation and the perspective on the topic it, it, it's really helpful to look at this from so many different angles um, well folks, thank you so much feel free to continue to drop questions in the chat if you have them um, i'm just going to cover a couple of quick things for our uh, around the tableau web session and then we'll call it a day here but like i said if you have questions pop them in the chat and we'll circle back um, let me share my screen real quick. There we go. All righty, can you guys see my, uh, my user group landing page? Yes, yep. no, maybe. Awesome, thank you, Rishi. <laughs> Appreciate the validation. Um, as always, we're going to cover this one. So our user group page, usergroups.tableau.com slash Charlotte. Here's where you can find all of the information about this group. So everything from the Tableau shorts we feature from other groups, best of virtual tug. So uh, groups around the world, we uh, help point you to their content, our community forum, our very own personal YouTube channel where you can watch any of our previous recordings. Um, you can also get in touch with us and subscribe to, to, to future uh, meeting invites uh, here. Again, that's usergroups.tableau.com slash Charlotte. Um, so that's out there. Um, Tableau has also started uh, this user group weekly. I don't think Alyssa is still with us. She was on at the beginning, but I want to shout her out for this initiative as well. Uh, so hopefully she listens to this recording. Um, what Tableau is doing is they're featuring the user group meetings on any given week. You can monitor this page and see who's meeting. I noted earlier that we are not geographically constrained in this virtual environment. So if you want to be in Kansas City, if you want to be in Edmonton, if you want to be in Brisbane, it's all you can be anywhere you want to be. If you want to be in the Netherlands, I don't think it's given in English, but just, you know, if, if that's something you're into, go for it. Um, I know Rashid, who has been part of our group, has spent uh, a considerable amount of time visiting the tugs of the world virtually and I challenge you to do the same, right? Uh, it's a great opportunity uh, if we look on the bright side of the virtual environment. So that's out there. Um, for those of you who may be feeling a little froggy, Iron Viz is still open. So Iron Viz is an annual competition uh, where you uh, put your stuff up against the best of the best. Um, the, the, feet, the Iron Viz qualifier is open for about another week. Um, the top three, uh, the, the top three from the feeder will advance to the Iron Viz championship, which will be held during the Tableau conference this year. Uh, be on the lookout uh, for uh, announcements coming soon on Tableau conference dates, uh, ways to attend, et cetera. Um, that's not what I wanted to do. And this, uh, yesterday, Tableau 2021.2 officially released. So uh, really some, some interesting features here that we may cover in further detail. Um, big, big change here with ask data and explain data now being available to viewers on your uh, server. Uh, previously, that had been restricted to creators and explorers. So that is a big positive, some additional control around map layers, which was a new feature earlier this year. Um, 
Uh, connected desktop is an interesting one. That's the ability to maybe start uh, developing via web authoring and pivot natively to the, to the desktop app if you'd like, and then some additional spatial uh, calculations. So a lot, of, a lot of interesting features here. Come out to the uh, tableau.com 2021.2 features and read, uh, read up for yourself. Um, some community project news. Uh, a new initiative was announced around color. I thought this made a nice tie in with what Emily talked about. Not all of these color palettes are accessible, but darn, some of them look real good. <laughs> um, uh, this is an initiative from uh, Ken Florlidge and, and Rodrigo uh, to start to uh, leverage the best of the community to build uh, an easy tool where you'll, you'll then be able to import your this mass of color palettes into Tableau directly and benefit from from the knowledge of the group. So they're put people are um, providing their own color palettes to the project, and you'll be able to uh, to download uh, regularly reg or regular updates. So a lot of really cool stuff out here. Um, Keep an eye on this. Uh, this is uh, on Ken Florlid or the Florlidge Twins site, florlidgetwins.com. Um, and then finally, I wanted to point you to a. So I know a lot of the a lot of the folks who regularly attend here um, are enterprise customers of Tableau and are likely pretty locked down in your environment and want to practice with real data sets. So um, I want to point you to a project that is technically closed, but this is a great way to pick up a number of ready-made data sets for analysis. This is real-world fake data. Uh, Mark Bradburn ran this project for a little over a year, or little around a year or so, and published a variety of data sets for you to pick up and build with. So a lot of different use cases, but they're more applicable to the real world. So human resources data, insurance data, call center, it's all fake. You don't have to worry about any PII or anything like that. It's all fake data, uh, but you can go out and uh, pick these data sets up, explore. And the benefit of picking up a project when it's already wrapped is a lot of recaps are written so that you can benefit from things that other folks submitted and worked well. So you can start to build your own customizations there. Um, a lot of really, really cool stuff out there. Again, this one is uh, on Mark's site, sonsofhierarchies.com. It's real world fake data was the name of the project. Uh, so that's uh, today's news from the Tableau web. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if there's no other questions in the chat. Um, really look forward to seeing you. We'll have uh, announcements coming soon on uh, next speaker. So. Keep your eyes peeled for uh, invites and we hope to see you again soon, uh, both virtually and at some point again in person. Um, hope everybody has a nice Friday and a great weekend.